Last week we began a new series on the 12 disciples. And for those of you who aren't able to name the 12 disciples, don't worry about it. Really all you have to do is know where you need to find a list of the disciples and then you can actually name them for other people. And you can find that list in the book of Matthew chapter 10 verses 2 through 4 and also in Mark chapter 3 verses 16 through 19. Now last week we covered Simon Peter and his brother Andrew and this week we're going to cover James and John the sons of Zebedee. Now, I told you last week that I was going to try and pick up the pace and cover three to four disciples per sermon. And as I was studying this week, I realized that's just not possible. There's just way too much information on James and John, too much pertinent information that you really need to know. In fact, I ended up with 73 pages of notes. Yeah. And so I realized I'm going to have to whittle this down for my sermon because we're not going to spend a month on James and John. We're only going to spend this morning on James and John. So I whittled it all down, and I'm still not sure that I'm going to be able to finish, but you don't have to worry. When it turns 11 o'clock, I will shut down and start wrapping it up because I know you want to beat the Baptist at the restaurants, and so we're going to make sure that you do that. So let's talk about James and John, the sons of Zebedee. James, like Andrew, was overshadowed by his younger brother John. And though James was part of Jesus' inner circle, his brother John was always the one that was described as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Look at John chapter 20, verse number 2, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Notice what it says. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Now look at John chapter 21, verse 7. Then the disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and he headed to shore. So as you can see, John truly was Jesus' favorite. Now, let's get honest with each other for just a second. How many of you don't like me saying that John was Jesus' favorite? Be honest. In fact, when you hear that, it just kind of goes all over you, like fingernails on a chalkboard, you know, that feeling. And the reason you don't like me to say that is because you've always been taught that God is no respecter of persons, and that's true. In Acts chapter 10, verse number 34, Peter said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. In other words, God shows no partiality or loves some more than he loves others. And Paul says the very same thing in Romans chapter 2, verse number 11. Paul wrote, For there is no respect of persons with God. Now that's how the King James Version translates it. How does the NIV translate it? Well, here's what it says. It says, for God does not show favoritism. And yet, John was the disciple that Jesus loved. In fact, as you read through the Gospels, Jesus seemed to show favoritism towards John. Jesus seemed to love John a little bit more than he loved the other disciples. So what's the deal? Well, let me give you a principle that explains what seems to be a contradiction. In other words, let me give you a principle that explains why God seems to show favoritism towards John, even though the Bible explicitly states that God does not show favoritism. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down because this is a very important principle. This will help you to understand favoritism in the Bible. Are you ready for it? Here it is. God loves everyone, but he's passionate towards those who are passionate towards him. Oh yeah. Let me say that again. God loves everyone, but he's passionate towards those who are passionate towards him. And John was passionate towards Jesus. At the Last Supper, it was, it was John that was reclining next to Jesus, and he laid his head upon Jesus' chest. When Jesus was arrested, only two, two disciples followed Jesus as he was taken into custody, Peter and John. And when they got to the palace of the former high priest, Annas, John went into the palace while Peter stayed outside. Look at John chapter 18, verse 15, and the first part of verse 16. I want to show you some interesting things about this. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was well known unto the high priest. And he went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest, but Peter stood at the door without in other words, outside. And when John realized that Peter hadn't come in, he went out to get him. And he brought him inside. Look at verse 16. But Peter stood at the door without. In other words, outside. 
Then went out that other disciple, which was well known to the high priest, and he spoke unto her that kept the door. And he brought in Peter. Of course, Peter didn't feel comfortable inside or safe because he was afraid someone would recognize him. So he went out of the palace and back into the courtyard. Look at verses 17 and 18. The woman asked Peter, what woman? The one who was at the door, the servant. She asked Peter when he came inside, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? No, he said, I am not. Now you need to understand what this is saying. When Peter and John followed Jesus when he was taken into custody, they got to the high priest's home and they went into the courtyard. Well, John just keeps going right on into the inner courtyard. He turns around and Peter's not there. So he goes back and he sees Peter in the outer courtyard and he turns to the servant girl and he says, he's with me and he motions to Peter, come on in. And then he turns around and goes right back into the inner courtyard. So Peter gets to go inside. So he walks in and the girl says, because she recognizes he's with John, and she's overheard Zebedee and the high priest talking. She knows that John's a disciple of Jesus. So she says, are you with that man, Jesus? And Peter says, no. And though he was inside, he turns around and he walks back outside to the outer courtyard. Look at verses 17 and 18 again. The woman asked Peter, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? No, he said, I am not. Because it was cold, the household servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire. They stood around it, warming themselves, and Peter stood with them, warming himself. So he went in, but quickly went back out when he was asked if he was a disciple of Jesus. And he hung out where the servants and the guards were. And of course, you know the story. Before the cock crowed, Peter denied him three times, but not John. In fact, when Jesus was on the cross, all of the other disciples were in hiding. They were in the home behind locked doors, behind windows that were shut up. They were afraid they were going to be arrested too. And they figured what was going to happen to Jesus. He's going to be crucified, and they didn't want to be crucified. So they were afraid, but not John. He was at the foot of the cross with the women. Look at John chapter 10, verses 25 through 27. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, who is that? John. Standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. If you ever go to Israel and you're coming down the Mount of Olives are coming down that pathway that's, that's known as the Victory March. It's, it's the celebration of Jesus. It's when Jesus was going into Jerusalem right before uh, that week when we, which he was crucified. As you're going down there, it's kind of interesting. You get to what is known as the Garden of Gethsemane. On the other side is the Grotto of Mary. Supposedly, that's where her body is. That's where she was buried, but it's not. Mary was buried in Ephesus, and you want to know why she was buried in Ephesus? Because John took her in as his own mother, and she always traveled with John. Yeah. Anyways, this explains why John was the disciple Jesus loved. You see, God loves everyone, but he's passionate towards those who are passionate towards him. And John was definitely passionate about Jesus. How many of you remember when you first got saved, and you were passionate about Jesus? And it seemed like God was speaking to you in every sermon. It didn't matter what the pastor spoke on. It seemed like that pastor was speaking directly to you. And the message was coming straight from God. And when you turned on the radio, God was speaking to you through the DJ or through a song. And you were growing by leaps and bounds. And you were telling everyone about Jesus. And everyone was a little bit worried that you might be a fanatic. And then what happened? Well, you got busy with life. Yeah, you still went to church and you still read your Bible and, you know, you prayed every once in a while, but it wasn't the same. And now church is all about what God can do for you and not what you can do for God. And it kind of feels like God's not there anymore. And if he is there, he's way off. It's like you don't connect with him anymore. Well, honey, I got news for you. God didn't move away from you. You moved away from God. James chapter 4, verse number 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Listen to me, because this is very important. John was Jesus' favorite because Jesus was John's favorite. Did you catch that? That's something you ought to know. 
John was Jesus' favorite because Jesus was John's favorite. You see, John wasn't Jesus' favorite because Jesus was a respecter of persons. No, God is no respecter of persons. And people, Jesus is God. The Bible explicitly states that Jesus is God. All you have to do is read through the New Testament and you'll come to the conclusion that Jesus is God because it's explicitly stated through the New Testament. In John chapter 20, verse 28, and 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, and Acts chapter 20, verse 28, and Colossians chapter 2, verse number 9, and Titus chapter 2, verse number 13, and John chapter 1, verse 1, and then jump down to verse number 14. The Bible explicitly states that Jesus Jesus is God and the Bible also says God is no respecter of persons so if Jesus is God then Jesus must not be a respecter of persons but the reason Jesus was closer to John than he was to the other disciples is because Jesus draws close to those who draw close to him you see God's proximity to you is in direct proportion to your proximity to him yeah let me say that again. God's proximity to you is in direct proportion to your proximity to him. In other words, the closer you draw to God, the closer God draws to you. So I want you to pull out your discipleship card. If you don't have your discipleship card or you're new and you don't have a discipleship card, then go to our connections counter. That's our connect groups counter. And make sure that you pick one up. If we run out of them, don't worry about it. In two or three weeks, we'll order more. I gave you this discipleship card years ago. And let me tell you why I gave it to you. It's because I want you to become a true disciple, not just a student of the Bible. There's a difference between a true disciple of Jesus Christ and a student of the Bible. You see, a student of the Bible really wants to learn the Bible, but they only want to learn for the sake of learning. They really don't intend to apply what they learn from the Bible to their personal life. But a true disciple of Jesus Christ wants to be like Jesus. So what does he do? He studies the Bible to learn about the Bible, but he has the intention of putting it into practice in his personal life. So every time you listen to a podcast, every time you come to church and you hear me preach, every time you study the Bible, you should ask yourself one of, or you should ask yourself three questions. Number one, is there a command I should obey? Number two, is there an example I should follow? Or number three, is there a principle I should live by? Well, I'm going to give you a principle that you should live by. I've already given it to you, but I want you to understand you need to apply this to your life, and here it is. God loves everyone, but he's passionate towards those who are passionate towards him. So if I want God to draw closer to me, then I have to draw closer to him. The bottom line is, I need to be passionate about Jesus. And if I'm not passionate about Jesus, then I need to go back and do the things I did when I first fell in love with Jesus. In fact, notice what John told the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Notice what he said to them. He said, and you have perseverance. That's a good thing. And have endured for my name's sake. That's a good thing. And have not grown weary. That's a good thing. But I have this against you. Oh. Notice that word, but. Oh. So like that kind of cancels out everything you said before. So he says, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. You know what he's saying? I'll remove you far away from me. In other words, your proximity to God is in direct proportion to God, or God's proximity to you is in direct proportion to your proximity to God. If you're not close to God, then he moves you further out. That's what he's saying here. You see, the church of Ephesus had gotten so caught up in doing the work of the ministry, they forgot why they were doing the work of the ministry. In essence, they had lost their first love. So the Lord told them to remember how it used to be when they first got saved. He said, remember how passionate you used to be about Jesus and about the things of me. Remember the quality, quality time you spent with me, reading my word and praying. Remember the excitement of going to church and learning about me. And then Jesus told them to go back and do their first works. In other words, do the things they did when they first got saved. Because if you want to be passionate, you have to do the things that stokes 
the fire of passion. Remember, God loves everyone. He loves everyone. He's no respecter of persons, but he's passionate towards those who are passionate towards him. And also remember that God's proximity to you is in direct proportion to your proximity to God. That's why we want you to join a small group. The reason we want you to, to join a small group is because the primary purpose of small groups, primary purpose is to make disciples. Everything else is secondary to that. Biblical community, secondary. Evangelism, secondary. Yeah. Exhibiting pastoral care, secondary. Fellowship, secondary. The primary purpose of joining a small group is to become a true disciple of Jesus Christ. When you get together, you share from the word, you watch a video, then you discuss if there's a command you should obey. Is there an example you should follow? Is there a principle you should live by? And then you discuss how you apply that to your life so you can become more like Jesus. And then what you find out when you do that, you start living in biblical community. You start exhibiting pastoral care towards each other. You start fellowshipping with one another. You start evangelizing because you become more like Jesus. So we want everyone to be a part of a small group because of that. Now let's move on and talk about James and John's family. As you probably guessed, their family was not only well off financially, but they were also very well connected politically. We know that they were well off because they owned a business and they had several employees. If you remember, James and John's family was in partnership with Simon Peter and Andrew. Look at Luke chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to be fishing for people. And Mark chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 reveals they had several hired servants, what we would call employees. Look at Mark 1, verses 19 and 20. A little further up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. Now remember, they're partners with Peter and Andrew. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Not only that, but Zebedee, who was James and John's father, owned two homes. One on the northern coast of the Sea of Galilee, where their business was, and it was a nice home, and also one in Jerusalem. Now, let me just ask you a question. This is kind of going off on a tangent, but it's okay. Why in the world, when Jesus and the 12 disciples went to Jerusalem, why didn't they stay at Zebedee's home in Jerusalem? I mean, let's be honest. He's a personal friend with the high priest. We're going to see that in just a minute. His home was huge. It was big enough for all of the disciples of Jesus, but they never stayed there. Why? Because Zebedee wasn't a follower of Jesus Christ. So where did they stay? They stayed with Mary and Martha and her brother Lazarus, right? Yeah. So every time they went to Jerusalem at the times of the feast, the three feasts, that's where they would stay. Now, I have to be honest with you. It's Zebedee's political connections that impresses me the most. Because James and John had the same connections. You see, Zebedee, as I said, was a personal friend of the high priest. In fact, Zebedee was in the habit of visiting the high priest in his home, and he did so frequently. So frequently that even the servants knew him and his family. Look at John chapter 18, verses 15 and 16, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. We're going to read this again. We've already read it first, but I want to see it from a different light. Notice what it says. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus because this disciple was well known to the high priest. Who is this disciple? John. He was well known to the high priest. Let's keep reading. He went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. Now, the King James Version says he went into the high priest's palace. So it refers to it as a palace. Here it says courtyard, which is right. Well, actually, the King James Version is. You see this word palace, and here translated as courtyard, is translated from the Greek word ale. Now, if it was a small home, the word ale refers to the out, outside courtyard. But if it's a huge home, if it's a palace, if it's a mansion, it would have more than one courtyard. You would have an outside courtyard and you would have an inner courtyard. Well, this is the high priest home, or former high priest, Annas. And so it has an outside courtyard and an inner courtyard. And the inner courtyard was considered to be part of the house. 
So when he goes in, he goes into the inner courtyard. We know that from reading it. So this should have been translated as palace. So let's keep reading. Because this disciple was well known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's palace. But Peter had to wait outside the door. Why? Because they didn't know who he was. The other disciple who was well known to the high priest came back spoke to the servant girl on duty there and brought Peter in. In other words, he goes in because he's not paying attention. He's watching what's going on, and then all of a sudden it dawns on him, where's Peter? So he goes back, he goes, ah, oh, they don't know Peter. So he goes back and he tells the servant girl, who knows John, because he's visited frequently in the high priest's home. And he says, you see that guy right there? He's with me. Let him come in. And then he motions to Peter to come in, but he turns around because he's passionate about Jesus, and he goes back to watch. Peter comes in, and he comes to this girl. Now, this girl's been listening all this time because she's a servant girl. This is her job. She's listened to Zebedee and the high priest talk about Jesus and even talk about Zebedee's sons, James and John's, being disciples of Jesus. And Zebedee is not happy with that. So she knows that John and James... Our disciples. So when John goes back and says, Peter, come on in, and he turns around, Peter comes in, the girl says, Aren't you one of the disciples? And Peter says, No, no, I'm not. Now, we know that this other disciple, the one that went and told the servant girl, is John. And the reason we know that is because John was in the habit of, of referring to himself as the other disciple. Let me show you a few scriptures so you'll see what I'm talking about. Because every time you read through the book of John and it says, and the other disciple, that, that is always referring to John. So let me show you how John gets in the habit of doing this. Look at John chapter 20, verses 2 through 4. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple. Who is that? John. How do we know the other disciple is John? We'll keep reading. The one whom Jesus loved. Who's the disciple whom Jesus loved? John yeah she said they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him Peter and the other disciple who is that John started out for the tomb they were both running but the other disciple John outran Peter and he reached the tomb first now look look at John chapter 20 verse 8 finally the other disciple who is that John who had reached the tomb first also went inside and saw and believed now this really isn't doesn't have anything to do with what I'm teaching on but why did John outrun Peter anyone know is it because he was faster than Peter well yeah that's obvious but why was he faster than Peter well we know that Peter died sometime around 67 AD at the age of around 75 Jesus was crucified in 32 subtract 32 from 67 and you find out that at the time Jesus was crucified Peter was 40 years old John was 19 to 20 this 20-year-old man outran a 40-year-old man. No big news there, right? Yeah, so that's why he outran him. 20 years old, he's still in shape. Peter's starting to be an old man. Starting <sighs> and John, he's still in his prime. And he's passionate about Jesus, and he plays through the pain. But anyways, what's interesting is the other Gospels don't even mention this other disciple. In fact, the only reason that John does is because it's him. Well, let's go a little bit further. As I said earlier, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, all the disciples were in hiding in homes, behind locked doors with closed windows, except for one. And who was that one? John. John was at the cross. The scriptures say, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. In fact, Acts quotes that because it's a prophetical scripture. It's from one of the prophets. And they using this to say, you know, Jesus was struck, he was the shepherd, and the sheep scattered all but one. Yeah, John. John was at the cross. Look at John chapter 19, verses 25 through 27 again. Notice what it says. Sending near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved. Oh, yeah. Love that disciple. All the others have scattered, but there he is. He said to her, dear woman, this is your son. You want to know why? Even Jesus' brothers weren't there. Yes, Jesus had brothers. 
Mary was a virgin when she conceived. She had Jesus. But after she gave birth to Jesus, her and Joseph had a husband and wife relationship. And she had other children. The Bible tells us that. But even his brothers weren't there because they were scared. There's only one person that's there that's the man that followed Jesus, and it's John. So he says, dear woman, here's your son. No matter what happens, this proves he's going to always be here for you. And he said to this disciple, well, here's your mother. And from then on, his disciple took her into his home. Now, let me ask you a question. We know that all the other disciples were in hiding. We know that for a fact. They were afraid for their life. So why was John not afraid to be there? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because his dad was a close personal friend with the high priest. Dad and the high priest were like this. But even if he was in danger, John didn't care because he was passionate about Jesus. And that's why I say the 12 disciples were not a ragtag team of poor and uneducated men that followed Jesus because they didn't have any better thing to do. You know, a bunch of homeless men, hey, we'll follow you, Jesus. You provide food, right? You multiply the fish, you multiply the We'll always eat with you. No. People, that's wrong. The 12 were highly successful, well-connected, educated men who left everything to follow Jesus. So why does Acts say that they were uneducated? Well, read it in context. These are the Jewish leaders, and they can't stand Jesus. And to them, rabbinical training was everything. You had your formal training at the synagogue till you reached the age of 15 or 16. If you were extremely bright and your family had means and you had connections with the rabbis, you went on with your education to study the Torah and become either a rabbi, a scribe, or a lawyer. Yeah, that's what you did. But these men, with the exception of John, that had been passed over. Either they weren't gifted in their teaching or their families did not want them to go study with the rabbis, so they went into business with their family. But when Jesus comes along, he's a rabbi, and he says, I want you to be my disciples. So now they're studying the Torah with Jesus. Everyone with me? But when they see that because they have no respect for Jesus, they make this comment that they're uneducated men, and they don't mean that they weren't educated in the sense that we think of educated. They mean they haven't received proper rabbinical training. But yes, they had from Jesus for three and a half years. And that's why I say, don't believe everything you've heard or you've read. Read the Bible. Now, let's briefly touch on James and John's family life. James and John's mother, Salome, was a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 and 21. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor of Jesus. What is your request, he asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in place of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. Now, people, she wouldn't have asked this of Jesus unless she was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. So Salome was a follower of Jesus Christ. And when I say Jesus Christ, Christ is not his last name. It's not his surname. Christ is a title. The word Christ is transliterated from the Greek word Christos, and it literally means anointed one, which is a title for the Messiah. So when I say that she was convinced that he was Jesus Christ, that means I'm saying that she was convinced that Jesus was the anointed one. Jesus was the Messiah, as was her sons. Now, Look at Mark chapter 15, verse number 40. Some women were there. Where? Well, if you read this in context, at the cross. Watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, the younger of Joseph, and Salome. And who is Salome? Salome is the mother of James and John, the wife of Zebedee. Now jump down to Mark chapter 16, verse 1. Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Now, I want you to notice when this took place. Jesus is crucified on a Thursday. He had to, had to be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. You have to be able to count. Whenever it says days and nights, it's not referring to a 24-hour period. It's referring to daylight and nighttime. Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. Can you count? He wasn't crucified on a Wednesday or a Friday. Can you count? 
Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Saturday night, and the Bible says before the sun came up on the first day of the week, Sunday, Jesus was resurrected three nights. What about days? He was crucified and died at 3 o'clock on Thursday. So you have that daylight there, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Jesus was resurrected before the sun came up on Sunday, three days and three nights. Everyone with me? So Thursday was Passover. He's crucified. Then the next day, which is Friday, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's treated as a high day. It's just like the Sabbath, except even more holy. It's the Feast of, of Unleavened Bread. Then you have Saturday, which is the Sabbath. When the sun goes down, now you can do work. So they go to buy burial spices. Why? Because on Sunday morning, when there's light, they're going to go. They're going to ask someone who's working on the first day of the week to roll the stone back so they can apply these burial spices. Now, I can guarantee you that Zebedee was not too happy about Salome doing this. And you'll see why I say that in just a second. But Salome was a devoted follower of Jesus Christ, as were her two sons, James and John. Now, Zebedee is never mentioned as a follower of Jesus. Why? Well, early tradition says that as an Orthodox Jew, Zebedee didn't share his family's faith in Jesus or approve of them becoming disciples of Jesus. And in all probability, Jesus was thinking of Zebedee when he spoke about forsaking father and mother for his sake. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse number 36, or actually verses 36 and 37. And remember, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, we have the list of the disciples. So right after Jesus has all 12 disciples, he says this, but in all probability he says this because of Zebedee. Notice what he says. Your enemies will be right in your own household. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. Who's he thinking of? Zebedee. Who's James and John thinking of? Zebedee. Who's Peter and Andrew thinking of? Zebedee. Who's all the other disciples thinking of? Zebedee. Now, James was the very first disciple to be martyred. Look at Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. Now, I want you to notice it wasn't the high priest. Why didn't the high priest have this done? Well, first of all, they didn't have the ability to do that. That's why they had to turn him over to Pilate for Jesus to be crucified. But secondly, Caiaphas and his father-in-law, Annas, are personal friends with Zebedee. They're like this. The king Herod Agrippa is not. He's not even a Jew. He's an Edomian, an Edomite. And as an Edomite, he really kind of despises the Jews. That's why the Jews never liked King Herod the Great, because he wasn't a Jew. The Romans didn't understand that because of the Maccabean period. They had one of three choices. You could either convert to Judaism, you could move, or you could die. So they chose to convert to Judaism, but they weren't true Jews, and everyone knew that. King Herod Agrippa was King Herod the Great's son, and he was happy to do this. Now, according to tradition, James wasn't stabbed with a sword. He was chopped in two with a sword. He was hacked to death. Now, you probably heard pastors and theologians refer to John as the apostle of love. And that's because John used the term love over 80 times in his writings. And when I say the term love, I don't mean eros love. I don't mean stergo love. I don't mean phileo love. I mean agape love. He uses the word agape over 80 times in his writings. But John never taught love as a sentiment or feeling, but as a choice or decision to behave towards others the way God behaves towards us. You see, from John's perspective, love, had, love has nothing to do with feelings and everything to do with the way we behave. And I think that's why we have such a difficult time with the biblical concept of love. We tend to think of love as a feeling. But the Bible's con concept of love has nothing to do with feelings and everything to do with our behavior. In fact, turn with me, if you would, to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Now, this is Paul's writing. This is not John's writing, but it's the very same concept, okay? Everyone with me? It says, love is patient. Agape love is what it's talking about. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now I want you to notice that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 isn't describing how agape love feels. No. It doesn't say 
Agape love warms the heart. It makes your heart flutter and your toes tingle. It gives you butterflies in your stomach. It makes you excited to see the person you love, and it makes you sad to say goodbye. No, it doesn't say that at all. Why? Because agape love isn't a feeling. It's a decision, a, a choice to behave in a certain way. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13 has nothing to do with feelings and everything to do with behavior. In other words, it's describing the way that agape love behaves. Now let me read these verses in everyday language so you'll understand what it's actually saying. Here it is. Agape love doesn't make me feel patient. It makes me act patiently. Agape love doesn't make me feel kind. It makes me act kindly. Agape love doesn't act jealous, jealously. It doesn't brag. It doesn't act arrogantly. Agape love doesn't act rude. It doesn't step on others. It doesn't get mad and it doesn't keep score. Agape love protects others. It chooses to trust others. It perseveres and it never gives up on a person. So let me say this again. The biblical concept of love has nothing to do with feelings. It has to do with the way you behave towards others. It's a choice. It's a decision to behave towards others the way that God behaves towards us. The way 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is describing. So when you read about love, and you will because he mentions agape 80 times. So when you read about love in John's gospel or his epistles, you have to keep this in mind. And things will make a whole lot more sense if you do. Especially when he talks about us being commanded to love. You see, we're not commanded to feel a certain way. Let me tell you, that would be almost impossible. I have to feel this way. I'm telling you, it's hard to control feelings. But we're not commanded to feel a certain way. We're commanded to behave a certain way. But here's what's great. If we behave the way that we're supposed to behave, it will affect the way we feel. Yeah. It's called the praxis principle. How many of you have ever heard of the word praxis? I've used this before, given you this principle. Practice, P-R-A-X-I-S. Praxis is defined as a habitual way of behaving. So let me give you the praxis principle. Everyone knows what a principle is, right? fundamental truth that explains how something works so listen to me this is a fundamental truth that explains how our behavior affects our feelings so here's the principle if you're taking notes write this down the way we habitually behave towards someone will eventually affect the way we feel about them if you treat your wife like a princess you'll feel like she's a princess if you treat her like crap you'll feel like she's crap wives if you treat your husband with respect, you'll feel respect towards him. If you treat him like crap, you'll feel like he's crap. That's the advice I always give to brides and grooms when I officiate wedding ceremonies. Now, let me tell you a true story that kind of illustrates this. There was a marriage counselor that had a couple that he was counseling, and he really thought, I don't think I can help them. So much animosity is built in their marriage that they actually hate each other. And he'd been st he had spent months with them, and nothing seemed to work. The walls were up. He was thinking it was impossible. And one day he got a phone call from the man. And the man said, I know that you like to, couple, uh, you like to counsel us as a couple, but if you don't mind, I'd like to come see you privately. Now, normally he wouldn't do that. He would only counsel them as a couple. But he said, sure, come on in, because he thought, you know, nothing else is working. Let's see what he wants to say. So the man came in, and he said, I just want you to understand, I think you're a great counselor. I really do. But the truth is, our marriage is hopeless. It's never going to work. And I have to be honest. I hate my wife. I hate her. I know I'm not supposed to hate her. I know that the Bible commands me not to do that, but I hate her. So I'm going to ask you a favor. I really want to hurt her the way she's hurt me. Can you tell me what I can do to hurt her the most? And the marriage counselor says, hmm. And he thought about this for a second. He thought to himself, you know, nothing else is working. So he said, yeah, I think I can help you do something that will really hurt her. I mean, it will rip her heart out. And the man said, please tell me. He said, here's what I want you to do for the next 60 days. I want you to treat her like a princess. I want you to serve coffee to her in bed every morning during the week. And on the weekends, I want you to serve her breakfast in bed. I want to make sure that you open the doors for her. You pull out the chairs for her. He said, you listen to her, whatever she says. Don't offer any advice. Just listen. He said, you treat her like she's the most important thing in the world to you. 
And the guy said, I don't know. But they said, listen, listen to me. And after 60 days, when she thinks that you're so in love with her, that you love her unconditionally, that's when you serve her with the divorce papers. That's when you file. He said, man, that's brilliant. That's exactly what I'll do. So he went home. And for 60 days, he did all of those things. Well, 60 days passed. The marriage counselor hadn't heard from them. So he calls the man and he says, I was thinking about you 60 days have passed. He said, have you filed for divorce yet? And the man said, are you crazy? Why would I divorce her? She's the most important thing in my life. She is the flame to my candle. She's everything that I would ever want. I will stay married to this woman for the rest of my life. You're a horrible counselor. And he slams down the phone. <laughs> the counselor sitting at his desk. He turns to the mirror that's in his office. He smiles. He says, you're good. <laughs> that's the praxis principle. And that's why the Bible commands us to love our enemies. And I have to be honest with you, there's some people I have a hard time loving. And every time I act rudely to them, the God just gets on to me. Every time I don't do what I'm supposed to do, God says, Phew. and I realize unless I do those things, it won't affect my feelings. We need to understand that. John knew that. That's why he's called the apostle of love. So I'm here to tell you that you need to follow his example. Because if you begin to follow his example, it will change you. But not only that, you'll get closer to God. And when you get closer to God, God gets closer to you. When you become passionate about Jesus, Jesus becomes passionate about you. You'll become Jesus' favorite because Jesus is your favorite. And God is no respecter of persons. He's just respecting your wishes.